Starship Star Vexer. Its eternal mission to explain this mind where no mind has gone before. We are now about to engage Starship Star Vexer. Travel travel through the mind of Vex Vexer. A mind continuing to be throughout round eternity, forging its way its way many multi dimension dimension sometimes it's sometimes in the space in space sometimes sometimes as it has flashes flashes really I am your host Bill Gemini and We know, and that's why we're here fighting against the propaganda machine run by the powers that should not be. And welcome to my first broadcast here on Wolf Spirit Radio. My biker name just happens to be Wolf. And as my introduction says, my name is Bill Demarest, formerly christened as William James Demarest. That would be Will, I am, James is for games, and my last name is Dearest with an M. Hmm. I was up early this morning trying to prepare for a show that's going to be broadcast, uh, which you're listening to now. I looked at the clock, and it was 3.39, which is 3.39, which is Jesus' question. So I had to go for a walk because I had a few questions for Jesus. What am I going to do? What am I doing up all night? Well, that's one question I have for Jesus. Well, I'm devoted to being the best radio producer I can be for my very good friend, one of my dearest of all friends, Sharon, Star the Oracle. So what's my show going to be about today? Well, for one, I'm starting with a little introduction of the Earth Code. I'll be playing some clips. I'll be chatting with you. The first clip I'm going to play for you is what I called Earth Code Consciousness 101. The Earth Code, what is it? After believing the Earth Code had been revealed to me shortly after, and I mean within minutes of an out-of-body experience, I was moved to finally complete my book, The Earth Code at Hand, some 30 years later. Having failed at several attempts to do such, which started in 1992 and was a contributing factor to my divorce in 1995. Another attempt in 1997 while recuperating from back surgery, fizzled. Then again in 2000, having finally become computer literate and having saved this attempt on a floppy disk, then came 2001 and 9-11, and believing no one would be interested in such nonsense. I was driven to put it in the floppy drive and complete my task on 5-26-2005. Luckily, I still owned a relic with a floppy drive. Once published and released, coincidentally on my birthday in 2005, with a seven-year contract and my publisher owning all rights to my book for seven years, I accomplished nothing by being a published author, other than the ego builder it had become. Now some 41 years later, and a lifetime's worth of experience living and breathing after infecting my brain with this, what I like to call a Pentium processor for the mind, I am now ready to share it openly with those having possession of a brain of their own. Synchronistically, Bill Gates and I share the same birthday. So now it is time to unveil my book and share what my spirit was moved to write as a description on the back cover. Imagine you become aware that you are the next Earth intellect. Would you seek fame and fortune? Probably not. You would be smart enough to realize that being a celebrity would make your life a living nightmare. 
Your greatest accomplishment would be the achievement of complete peace of mind in a world that seems to have lost its mind. Peace of mind, though, can only be accomplished with purity of spirit, which in turn leads to being handpicked by God for a mission, a mission so bizarre that no one in modern history has attempted it. With the words from Jesus Christ Superstar echoing through his head for decades, one man takes on this mission. Earth has had its Michelangelo, its Shakespeare, its Edison, and it's Einstein, but it has never seen anyone like Billy. Others have mastered the laws of physics, the arts, and the study of the mind, but no man has ever been so bold as to show us how we're wasting the brains God gave us. After years of thinking what this meant, I now know how and why to interpret it myself. I am not a genius showing you how to be a genius. I have a system or head game to enhance what you think and how you view the world in a way you have never thought possible. And in doing so, you will be aware your life has changed and you will now be aware of synchronistic events in your everyday walk through this life as well as building a memory unparalleled before. And now I'm going to play a clip of a show where I was the interviewee on Truth Frequency Radio when I unleashed the Earth Code on the world. The Earth Code has been a 41-year-old monkey on my back. Let me get right to it. I'll be back. The steps to achieve the state of consciousness that took me way, way beyond anything I can imagine happening to anyone else. I was practicing a method of shutting down, putting my body to sleep, and, and opening my mind completely and absolutely awake. What I was doing is I was reaching a point where the last part of my body, I would feel like a tight rubber band wrapped around the top of my head and under my jaw, and I would feel it move forward, and then it would snap off as if it were a rubber band. And the moment it snapped off, there would be a spark. I mean, a brilliant spark, the crack of a whip. And then I would no longer have a body or feel anything except for I would see the music. Well, one day I pushed it just a little bit too far. I didn't see the spark. I didn't hear any crack of a whip. All I saw was this overwhelming flash of white light. And the next thing I know, I am outside of the sheet of the purest white light I have ever seen. This didn't blow my mind because I knew one thing. I am outside of my spirit viewing it. I questioned where my body was. I started thinking about my left knee. It became a dark spot in this sheet of the purest white light I have ever seen. And as soon as I stopped thinking about it, it became brilliant white light again. I tapped into universal knowledge. Well, when I was done and I sat up, how I, how I connected my, my consciousness with my spirit, with my body was... I shook my left arm through remote control, which was certainly a strange sensation. I sat up and I sat there pretty dumbfounded and I thought, I have to teach people this. I have got to teach people this. This is my mission in life is to teach people how to do this. As I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh, you fool. Why didn't you look up and around you to see who was viewing you? Because evidently this beacon of white light was seen in realms that I can't even comprehend. I realized that I needed a universal language to store what I was privy to. As I walked down the street, I'm thinking, well, my universal language, I can't make symbols up because people can't remember symbols, so I'll use symbols everybody recognizes. And at that moment, I realized I had never heard of gematria, but gematria was what I discovered. You have 26 letters and you use 10 numbers, 0 to 9. Each letter has a number value. And each letter has a word value. It was 1A amplification, 2C couple, 3G God, 4S structure, 5K knowledge, 6D doing 7H heaven or happiness according to what plane you're on, 8I infinity, 9Q question, 10A amplification, 11B build, 12R relation, 13 judgment, 14 yourself, 15 wisdom, 16 experience, 17 pleasure, 18 life, 19 thirst. 20, marriage, 21, union, 22, family, 23, nature, 
24 vow, 25 is X, the exception to the rule. 25 is the use of the earth code, which is multiplied knowledge. And 26 is zeal. Once I had this all sorted and basically downloaded it in my brain, I wondered, is there any real value to this? Well, the first number that comes to your mind is 69. And in earth code, that's doing question. Doing what? Doing who? Doing how? Doing when? So I realized that there was a real connection. It wasn't until, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I find out that the number 18 in ancient Hebrew is life. And in my code, it is life. Why the words and the numbers fit? Just for example, one is oneself and three is God. So therefore, 13 is oneself before God. Therefore, it's J, judgment. 22 is a family because that's two genders taking care of two genders. 24, vow, that was a tough one. What strengthens the couple's structure? Couple, two, four, structure. It has to be vow, the word. I have been enhanced by what I call the Pentel Pentium processor for the mind. Now, as for synchronicity, Bill Gates and I share the same birthday. And the use of the earth code, what it does is your brain is a transceiver receiver. We know the government can read your mind, and you know that dimensional beings can hear your thoughts. What I propose is anybody using this earth code in their brain will attract only the positive polarity because there is nothing, nothing negative about the earth code. For example, 666. Six is D doing, 66 is Bible because there are 66 chapters. So therefore, 666 is either doing Bible or Bible doing. Having the, the earth code run through my brain for three weeks, what I discovered, uh, a friend of mine said, Bill, he knew I was different. He said, Bill, you have to read the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. Now, Don Juan is not the lover. Don Juan is the Mexican Indian sorcerer. And out of the five books I read, the most important thing I learned was you must maintain a separate 24 hour a day, seven day a week alternative reality. Something different than the real world, the work a day world, the stubbing your toe in order to become a warrior. And the synchronicity, I've, I've been saying for years, Rod Surley could not have written an episode of Twilight Zone that would even rival my day-to-day -day life. You know, God set this up pretty good. He put the pieces together. It works. It enhances your memory. There's 26 realities. Now, the 1111, what that is, B is build. You build on this side of the veil as well as building on the other side of the veil. If you're aware of the other side of the veil, what you do here affects over there. The law of attraction is very real. I just do not use it. I ask God not to give me any special powers. I told him that if I was Job in a past life, he could do what he wanted with me in this life. So I accepted the road he put me on. And there are a few times I tried to leave this road, but he wouldn't let me building in this life will be in the other life. And many people have heard me. When you pass to the other side, you go to Star Vexers. It's a comedy club. What what better than to be up there laughing your mm, off? Uh, you go to Star Vexers and you ask for Vex Star and you will immediately locate me. Using the Earth Code, and seeing things differently as that alternative reality, which just, it sparks the mind. The, the other night, I did not go to bed until 6.36 that morning. Now, that is God in the midst of a Bible or doing God doing. I went and laid down. I woke up at 9.19, which is questioning thirst. Well, it's exactly right. I had to get to my coffee. What the earth code is, when you look at a clock, it's a memory. And it's something that you use to remember. And the thing is, when you see a number, it will fit the situation you are in. And the synchronicities I have gone through. So there isn't a song or a lyric that I cannot relate to my life. That's what makes my situation different. And it's all because of the earth code. 
as I said, when you use the earth code, it's going to make synaptic connections in your mind. Now, these synaptic connections are going to change your attitude, your role, what you do next, et cetera, et cetera, because you stopped and you paused to pay attention to the numbers. Emblazoned on the cover of my book is 526. And the reason for that number being there is because one morning, and it's, it's clearly explained in the introduction of my book, that that one number, that number was the, the number on my clock. As I pulled myself to the edge of the bed and I saw the clock, it said 526, I thought, knowing zeal. I got up and I changed my entire direction to actually finish writing this book. You know, numbers have such a subliminal message. As for the clock, as of late, every time, not every time, but when I look at it, it's 6543, it's 1234, it's uh, 321. And when I see that, and it, they're going up, I move forward. When they're going down, I recall a moment of the past. 26, it's zeal. When you see 26, you find zeal. You find something that takes you positive. 36 is very good. 35 is also great. It, it's anything with a three in it. Now, my birthday is 10, 28, 53, 1953. So it's amplify, coupling, infinity, and 1953 is thirsting, knowing God. My address is 300. Now, when you have two zeros, not only is it amplified, but it's both of God's eyes on you if the number is three. 333 three, three is God's number. I live in the 33316 area code, which is God experience. The reason for 16 being experienced is oneself doing one's self doing is experience. Wisdom is one's knowledge, which is 15. It is so easy. It's subliminal. It's just, you know, a three is God. A four is structure, four walls, five, the Pentagon, the pentagram. They all K know, they know. Six, don't ask me why it's doing, but it is. Seven, heaven, happiness, eight, the number of infinity. Nine, the only reason nine is a Q question is because it's shaped like a question mark. Now, 10 is oneself amplified by the zero. So it's a amplification. 11 is build because it's oneself and oneself. It's one brick and another brick to build. It's one ingredient and another ingredient to create a recipe. It's just so simple. I can teach this to eight-year-olds and they won't forget it. Here's an example. I'm at work. I'm wondering about the name of the movie where Ralph Macchio plays a guitar for the soul of the black man against the devil. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, and I can't. I sit down in the car, and what comes on? The song Crossroads comes on, okay? I'm driving in my car. I don't have the radio on. My clock says 1033. It says Amplify Jesus. I turn the radio on. God is my witness. The next words out of my radio are, Jesus is all right with me. The Doobie Brothers were right on cue. It's this, this is the kind of stuff. I, music was driving me crazy. I taped the air drill of the trickle to my air drill at work because we had five cars all playing different radios. It was not driving me nuts, but I couldn't handle it. I had to work. I had to focus on, I, I used to customize cars, sunroofs, moonroofs, T tops, ground effects, leather interior. Well, one day I had enough of it because every time I reach up, they're saying reach up. Every time I snap a drain tube, uh, the next words I hear are bull whips, whips cracking. Uh, one day I hear Phil Collins singing, there's a hole in there somewhere as I'm pouring glue into a tube. Well, I turn the tube around and, and it's leaking. This is the reality I live in. Oh, my God. One day I'm, I'm going through the uh, sliding glass doors with my headset on and I got a short in the extension cord on my headphones and Phil singing. I see your lifeline is breaking. Uh, the Bridges to Babylon tour, the Rolling Stones were Joe Robbie's uh, stadium doing B Bridges to Babylon, and the radio stations around me were playing the Bridges to Babylon album. Well, it was time to take a smoke, and as I'm going out the door, I hear the DJ say, well, we got gate crashers. I look down. I'm on the fourth floor. I look down, and I don't care if you believe me or not, there is a car crashed into the security gate. I had a gate crash here in my front yard. Okay, I go back inside. I write down, I'm writing my book at the time, I write down three songs that I listened to at the uh, Pizza Hut in 1975. They were Radar Lover by Golden Earring, Hypnotized by Fleetwood Mac, and they speak of the gentleman that can fly over mountains and streams without a plane or any engine, and that's 
That's Don Juan, the Mexican sorcerer. People don't know who they're speaking of. Uh, Smoke on the Water. I'm sitting down and I'm listing these three songs in my book. And the moment I finish listing them, the radio station I'm listening to plays those three songs one right after another. You tell me I don't think I'm being watched. You tell me I don't think that there's a webcam and a secure web watching my action. And it's that bizarre. But the one thing that saved me was the fact that no one could answer a question on my mind as fast as Crossroads. Oh, I haven't even scratched the surface. So I was talking about turning off my my air drill. From the far end of the shop, I hear, since you've been gone, all that's left is a band of gold. I look at my ring finger of my wedding band, and my ring is gone. It took a tenth of a second to remember that I helped a friend run a drain tube in the trunk of the car he was working on, had to take the ring off. I He's back in the car out to be delivered. I have to I get out of the car. I stop him for backing up, open the trunk and retrieve my ring. Now, at this point here, I was just so fed up with music following me. Everything I did, if I turned left, it said turn left. If I'm driving over a bumpy road and this happened, I'm driving over a bumpy road. The uh, talk radio guy says, well, now that the road smoothed out, OK, well, if it weren't for hearing that song, I would have lost my wedding ring. Yeah, it's just so at that moment, I said, well, whatever, whatever. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> if we all share our synchronicities, we'll wake up. And it has driven me crazy. I mean, it has scared me to where they were going to drop a nuke on me because of what I knew. As a host of a radio show for the first time in my life, way back when, a whole year ago, as of September 26th, I found it uh, beneficial to have many co-hosts, and Sharon was one of them. Well, my forte was getting guests. I've had a phenomenal list of guests on my show. It really does shock me how I've spent time talking to people I've been learning from for 10 years, since I first woke up and decided that I was going to be a truth sharer, a truth teller, and I was going to help wake up as many people as possible. Well, one of the people that was kind enough to help me fill a show was Tom Kiley. Tom Kiley is a DJ in New York, and he basically does the same thing we all do. He turns on the microphone and he does his show. Well, there was one particular segment in my show, and I made a YouTube video of it, and it's called A Message to Snowflakes. If I may, because uh, we're having such a great time here, and I was hoping to talk a little bit about the uh, aftermath of this election and what Donald Trump has, uh, in some cases deliberately, I'm sure, but I think in other cases quite inadvertently revealed to us. Please do. Well, during the break, we were talking about Kennedy and his assassination. And I think in this since this election, uh, when we've seen this incredible display from so many Hillary Clinton supporters, but in particular, the young people, the young adults, or they're supposed to be adults, young adults. And I and I look at how upset they are. And I understand why, because they've been sold a bill of goods. They've uh, they're the victims of a tremendous, carefully crafted reality shift. All this Frankfurt School political correctness, uh, cultural Marxism, and that there's just this, you know, it's human rights. Like, you know, you, you can't say that stuff. You're, you're going to be an evil person and everything. They're, they're, they're phony baloney because they supposedly care about the human rights of transgendered people and all of this and women's rights and all of that here in the United States. And they could, they, they're totally ignorant of the rights of the people of Libya who their hero you know, Hillary Clinton has just totally trashed all of these poor people from Syria that are looking for a home now. Uh, 300,000 people in Syria dead, okay? What about their human rights? Your champion Hillary kicked all of that stuff off. They're, 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 they don't know anything about it. But they, they're stressed by the fact that the uh, – uh, by what? By the exercise of the democratic system process in our country has stressed them out. And the result of that process has – gotten them so upset 
Okay, fine. You want to demonstrate? That's fine. That's what they told me I was in the army for. So you're right to demonstrate. Beautiful. Okay. And that, but they're trashing things and they're going to now not my president, all of this stuff. Yo, come on. And there's college kids here. And you can look the articles up. I don't know if you've discussed it on your show, but the, this is a, an incredible threat to the whole peace political correctness project because now political correctness is so inherently truthful and, 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 and right. How could Donald Trump have become the president? Well, the only way is that the rest of the country is all a bunch of ignorant racists that otherwise, uh, you know, it really calls their whole reason to be in, into question. Yo, kids. And, and they're going, and they've got safe. Did you know they had safe rooms for them, safe spaces on college campus to go to with play doh and coloring books? Play doh, coloring books. <laughs> the university students, yeah, yeah. okay. All right, university students. You want to know what stress is? You want to know what political stress is? How about when William and I was ten years old, and our beautiful, glorious, taking us blazingly into the future president was murdered, okay, in front of the whole world. How about that for some stress? And I'll tell you what happened to me on that day. Ten years, I had just turned 10 in October. My family had just moved to Northern Virginia from Long Island, New York. My father was working for AT&T. He got transferred from Manhattan to Washington, D.C. He got down there earlier in the year and we finished school and then during the summer he moved us down there in the suburbs of Fairfax Virginia northern northern Virginia right outside 14 miles outside of Washington in a brand new subdivision <laughs> in that in that subdivision it was just loaded with uh, officers at the Pentagon you know and they'd come for they'd be there a couple of years and then they'd, they'd move captain uh, air force captain around the corner just got back from Vietnam flying uh, phantom jets and stuff like that a colonel in the air force lived next door to us he and his wife had two daughters and a son we all went to the same public school we'd ride the school bus we'd go to the school so on this particular day we're going to take a break now give you a chance to stretch your legs get some coffee get some tea do what you got to do and then we'll get right back to it after I play this little song from Jan Christie, whom I've been creating music videos for for 10 years now. And we'll be back. You enjoyed that little song. And now let's get back to Tom Kylie. We'd ride the school bus. We'd go to the school. So on this particular day, at the end of the day, we're on the platform getting ready to go on the bus. And the ripple goes through the crowd. The president's been shot. And it's, wow, what's going on? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, there's my next door neighbor, the colonel's wife, with her three kids. And she says, come on, Tommy. You know, get your brothers. I'll drive you home. Now, First of all, this is totally unexpected. Secondly, it's great. Oh, man, we don't have to ride the bus and drop everybody. We'll get a ride right home. Okay, great. And we're in the car. She had a, I can remember to this day, a, a Ford station wagon with the rocket ship taillights on it and everything. 
And the radio's on. Uh, and by the way, uh, around that time, Johnny Cash's song Ring of Fire, you know, was a hit. And it, <laughs> I think it was a metaphor for the country. I fell into a burning ring of fire and it went down, 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 and the flames kept getting higher. We're listening to the radio in disbelief. Now the president's dead, all this stuff. So I said, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, I won't mention the family's name on the air, why did you come to get us today at school? Why, why, didn't we, why couldn't we just ride the bus home? You know what her answer was? In 1963, a woman whose husband was a colonel at the Pentagon told young Tom here, who was 10 years old, the president has just been shot. I don't know if there's a coup going on or something like that, but I need to know where my children are. Oh, okay? damn straight. All it right. Was a, it was a coup. Okay. But this woman tells me that. Now, you all who didn't like Trump, you want stress? Try that one. Okay. Try that one. And this was the days when – do you remember Seven Days in May, the film? That's a film that needs to be remade. Remember Seven Days in May? I do. Okay. And uh, The Manchurian Candidate. These things were films. John Kennedy wanted that film made, Seven Days in May. Did you know that? I, I you, you just sent chills through me. Go ahead. Seven Days in May is a dramatization of a military coup that takes place uh, during Seven Days in May in, in the United States of America. It was a book and then, and then a movie. Kurt Douglas is in it, okay? Burt Lancaster, I think, played the general. The, uh, yeah. All right? And this was uh, – this was this stuff was being portrayed dramatically during the height of the Cold War. They should remake that film, okay? Kennedy wanted – I think Franken was the, the director. He wanted that film made so bad that he actually uh, vacationed on Cape Cod – at a strategic moment, allowing the film crew to come into the White House and film. All right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff, and Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick, you know, that's the kind of stuff that was going on at the time. So if this ki if kids today want to know about political stress, that's only the beginning for young Tom, okay, at 10 years old. What happens next? The country falls into a burning ring of fire. Lyndon Johnson – Cuts loose all the restraints that President Kennedy had about going into Vietnam. And in a short time, we've got a half a million American soldiers killing Vietnamese people and getting killed themselves. OK, yeah. and there's no end to it. There's no it gets worse and worse. By 1968, uh, you know, by 1968, uh, Johnson's not going to run. The whole world is blowing up. Uh, you had the Quezon Offensive. Uh, in the beginning, the Tet Offensive, actually, in the beginning of that year, and then Quezon, the country just saw th there's not going to be an end to this war. All right. Now, I, I'm, I'm a few years older, but guess what, friends? The draft was in place. So 10 year old Tommy here is looking at the Vietnam War, and every year that goes by, that damn war is getting worse and worse. And I'm getting closer and closer to the chomping jaws of the draft. Okay. I was on a conveyor belt to a meat grinder for 10 years. That's stress, okay? That's stress. So you have to look at, as a young man in those days, you have to look at, you know, I'm this goddamn war isn't ending, and I'm getting closer and closer to it. And then finally, you know, uh, by the time I was in high school, at the end of my high school time, uh, the draft lottery comes up. I'm talking to a friend of mine's sister on the phone, a very uh, a lovely girl who was a really good friend of mine, and she was in a great mood. And I said to her, why are you so happy? She says, because the draft just came out and my brother got this really high number. And I said, oh, gee, yeah, it did yesterday, didn't it? And she said, yeah, yeah. I said, I wonder what my number was. And she said, uh, well, what was your birthday? I told my birthday. She was, huh? and I said, what do you mean? Huh? She said, I think your number is 10. Uh -huh. And that's what it was. Oh, my God, because I, I lived through that, too. And my my cosmic number is 327. My status was 1H, not being processed for induction. But, yes, I was in uh, junior high school when one of the teachers went into what the Vietnam War was and what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. And he looked at us and he said, don't think that none of you in this class are going to be going to that war. And you talk about stress. You're exactly right. For 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Hanging over your head, the sword of Damocles. Now, uh, I just made plans to join the military because by then, if you joined for an extra year or two, you could have a say in what your 
occupation specialty was and where you were going to be stationed. Fortunately, I, I got a deal. I cut a deal with the military. I served in what was called West Berlin as a photography uh, uh, photo lab technician, and I avoided Vietnam altogether because I totally didn't believe in that war. Uh, but the reason these kids are out on the streets protesting Donald Trump is because there's not a draft anymore. And because there's snowflakes. If there was a draft, they would be killing and dying in Hillary Clinton's wars. Wake them up. My initial inclination uh, when my lower self takes over is to use pejoratives and everything. But really, that's that's what they use on me, okay? I, <laughs> there was a... A hipster in the drugstore the other night, my wife and I were in there, and we got into a, uh, an altercation about something really stupid. He he misrepresented the situation and basically called me and the cashier a liar. But uh, the the thought occurred to me was that, you know, this kid can't see reality in front of his face. So mm -hmm. after we left, he went one way, I went the other, and I yelled back to him. I said, you know, Donald Trump won because of people like you. Now, I didn't say I like Donald Trump. I didn't say I voted for Donald Trump. I didn't even say I'm mad at you because Donald Trump won. I just said, you know what? People like you who can't see reality. I didn't see even say. I just always said Donald Trump won because of people like you. He and his little girlfriend started screaming at me. You're a racist. You're a misogynist. <laughs> Can you imagine? That was it. That was it. So I don't want to do to them what they're doing to me. You know, they need to wake up. And I don't think you wake people up by calling them deplorable despicables, even if they are. You know, you, you wake them up by talking truth to them and, and, and sticking with it, you know. And the, and the truth is, if, if we were getting paid $1,500 a week to protest the Vietnam War, I think it might have ended a little bit sooner. <laughs> well, I'm sure there aren't any snowflakes listening to our show, but perhaps you can subscribe get podcasts and sit a few of your snowflake friends down just to listen to that portion of it. Now I'd like to get into a video, Kate Tompkins. This woman is phenomenal. She will make you laugh and then she will bring you to the reality of the world around us. And it really, really, really is disturbing the truth of the world. This woman knows what's going on. And it really, really is scary. Sorry. We will fight back. I've got to believe it. People, we will fight back. When you see what's going on over there, when it comes to our door, we will fight back. Thank you very much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be, I don't know, amongst people that are prepared to fight for their country. And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. A couple things I should clear up, really, before I start. First up, I'm not Milo. And neither, slightly more offensively, am I Milo's mother. And also, for the record, some people on the democratic side of things say that I'm a crap Ellen DeGeneres. I'm not her either. Actually, I'm not even gay. I just have short hair. Those are two different things. I am a straight, white, conservative female with one husband and three children under 30. And where I come from, back in Blighty, that virtually makes me an endangered species. I'm on the extinction sort of list, the list of animals that are due for extinction. I'm up there with the black rhino. And he has an advantage because he's black. <laughs> black lives matter, people. In fact, the threat against me has become a little bit more real of late. I've been kind of under attack myself, I suppose, as so many of us have. Only last week, a lovely lady called Madia Hara Hara. <laughs> if I got that wrong, I don't apologize. <laughs> and her partner, they're, they're British, of course. <laughs> They were in court and they were found guilty of conspiring to commit acts of terror against citizens of the UK, one of which was to decapitate me. 
Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Islamic Extremist 2017 had been romancing a jihadi, and as her wedding gift, she wanted my head on a plate. I was at the top of her list because I am the biggest bitch in Britain. <laughs> yes, I am. She bought him a hunting knife, she bought him a plastic dummy to practice his stabbing skills on and they chatted about the glorious day on WhatsApp and in a rare example of the British police actually doing the job they've been paid for instead of placating the Muslim Mafia or policing my Twitter, she has been found guilty and sent down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> She is going down, and she better get used to that in the slammer that she's been sent to. <laughs> and I live to fight another day. And so here I am, and my message to you resonates with what the boys were saying. I was thinking they're a bit like the three wise monkeys, those guys, aren't they? <laughs> Except they do hear it, they do see it, and they do say it. So thank God for them. But my message is simple. Do not let this great country become the United Kingdom. Do not allow America to fall as Europe has fallen. Look at us, let us be a warning, be better than us. I've watched my country fall apart and I want to warn others before they let their country do the same. And believe me, I love my country. I'm not quick to talk it down. I was sponsored through university by the Intelligence Corps. I passed out of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst to serve my country as an army officer. We went in as a troop of 32 girls. We came out as eight more or less men. <laughs> oh yeah. It's still there, but it doesn't work that much. And I wanted to become the first female general. My, my epilepsy put pay to that. It's why I have short hair too, actually. But it brought me to the media, and so my fight goes on. And this fight is real. The UK today is a place few of us recognize. I get letters and emails, really upsetting ones, from 60 and 70 year olds struggling to make sense of the country they love. Like my mum and dad, they ask me, has the world gone mad? How, how is this all going to end up? Where does this stop? Some of them email me to say that they're glad they're old because they will be gone soon. And and they won't have to wait for the time they see their country fall. These are hard messages to read, and they're really hard messages to respond to. And believe me, I am wary of painting too depressing a picture. I have not come here to be part of the fear. I have not come here to talk my country down or to fail to see the good in Britain. But there are some blunt truths I believe it is my duty to tell. You are more likely to be raped in London than in New York. You are more likely to be attacked with acid from a guy on a moped in East London than in Islamabad. And when it comes to terror, the head of the UK MI5 said, the risk is now impossible to contain or to control. <laughs> Serving police officers in Muslim controlled areas of the UK email me and allege that the local imam at the mosque is in charge of selecting the police officers he will allow to police his neighborhood. In a relentless program of appeasement by the establishment, they continually seem to put the lives of jihadi and the Muslim mafia ahead of the lives of our own daughters. And in the latest recruitment round for the police, white British males were excluded from the day's coaching in how to pass the recruitment day. If you were white and male, you could not go. If you were gay or ethnic or black or any other minority, then you could apply. And I have nothing against those people. But the, in the UK, discrimination against whites is institutionalized and systemic. I applied for a place for my husband just to see if he could get through. He's a male, uh, vaguely, and he's white, and they said no. <laughs> but without a minority card to play or a race card, you have no grounds for address anymore in our country. The UK is now formed of two distinct territories. There is Londonistan and there is the rest of the UK. London and the rest of the UK. If you took Britain and spun it on its side, it is very much a baby America. London is Clinton. 
London is California, the bad bits, and all the good bits I see are here today. <laughs> London is Bill de Blasio's New York, and he's an utter cockwomble if ever I met one. <laughs> He may be tall, but he is the smallest man I know. And then there is a better place. There is a place called the rest of the UK. There is a place where hard-working Brits want to do a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. They want to look after their families. They want to love their country. They'll fight for their country. They support Trump. They voted Brexit. Occasionally we want to have a barbecue with our families, but we can't because it never stops bloody raining. That is a good place, and it's the place where I come from. It's the place where I put my lovely husband. It's the place I put my children, and it's the place that I live in. I live in a place called the rest of the UK and here people have grown weary about speaking out because it's just not worth the hassle there is mass silencing of the thoughts of Brexiteers of us deplorables considered racist or stupid or wrong we're browbeaten into shutting up but they're still there and there's a quiet rumble of discontent at the state of London, Londonistan. And that quiet rumble is getting louder. Our win for Brexit was just like your win for Trump, which I went on CNN and called a week before it happened. And that went really well. <laughs> <laughs> and when we stand together, our voices are a low rumble that becomes an almighty thunder. And our voices are heard. The quiet rumblings turn into a roar, and we're not alone. Across Poland, Italy, Austria, Germany, the voices of the discontented are rising up to reject the globalist agenda of the people that are managing the decline of Europe and letting us fall. Sebastian Kurtz, People's Party, he is also better looking than the Canadian Justin Trudeau, so take that, you lame-ass piece of crap. <laughs> the German AFD, the huge parade of patriots in Poland recently in support of national pride. You can feel the determination of the people that I talk to. I can feel the possibilities. There is hope. We do not have to watch our country fall. And there is action we can all take. There's three things I'd quickly like to run through, if I may. Firstly, most importantly, the same as the guys were saying, we must reject the narrative. Resist the narrative. Just because someone said it and they're wearing a uniform or a badge does not make it true. When we're scared, a strong narrative can be reassuring, like when we're little and a bad things happen and, and you run and you tell your teacher. And so too after terror. We look around for someone in a uniform to tell us what to do. These days in the UK they say run, hide, tell. My granddad fought in the war. These were not orders that he would recognise. And in the quiet calm of our streets, when the threat is neutralized and yet another terrorist is taken down, the media machine goes into action and it's terrifying to observe. We stand united. We are not cowed. The terrorists will never win. Repeated over and over by the Muslim mayor, by the prime minister, by the chief of police, the mantra of multicultural acceptance, the same script, everything the same time every time we stand united we are not cowed we stand shoulder to shoulder and the media run around with their cameras showing people drinking cups of tea like that's going to solve the problem <laughs> the real truth is not this fabrication we do not stand united our daughters were left crumpled on the sidewalk, some lost limbs, some under a truck, like the images you had of those bikes strewn on the cycle path in New York of the Argentinians. We do not carry on as normal. Mothers and fathers are burying their daughters. A boy I know wrote to me, he's learning to use his legs again after they were blown apart at the Manchester attack. He does not carry on as normal. Others seem to carry on as normal because what's the alternative? What, what, hiding in your home? Is that defeat? It's not normal to build walls on bridges of rings of steel around Christmas markets. If this is terror losing, I would hate to see terror win. Oh, yeah. 
enough of the candlelights, enough of your hashtags, enough of your heart-shaped gestures at the sky, enough of turning the Eiffel Tower lights on and off. I'm epileptic. Flashing lights don't do me any favour whatsoever. <laughs> I wrote all this, you know, in a column on Mail Online, I'll write for DailyMail.com, and, and I, I went on Tucker Carlson, uh, he did his best confused face, and, um, <laughs> I'm like, Tucker, quit that, Tucker, you're my mate, you do not have to put on a confused face just because we're on telly. <laughs> And for the crime of this column, which was a praise of what I just said, I was reported to the British Metropolitan Police for hate crime and inciting violence against Muslims. We can reject the narrative. Two, we can commit to arm ourselves, not just with the help of the NRA. Sadly, in the UK, we don't have that luxury of the Second Amendment. Our police on our streets are armed with the equivalents of a Clorox spray and a Band-Aid. Some even have a letter from their mum excusing them from gains. <laughs> but we can arm ourselves with information. Information that we find closest to the source, not information fed through the liberal filters of Google or the Californian Fruit Loops at Facebook. We must look for our own truths. I spent 48 hours in the migrant camp at Calais uh, in France, it's called the jungle, quite appropriate it seems to me, where African migrants masquerading as children um, and asylum seekers fought their way through tear gas and steel fencing to break into the trucks crossing over from France to Dover to sneak into the UK. My photographer was lynched, his camera was stolen, his wallet taken, he was bitten up, uh, beaten up. Um, and he ran, went home because uh, he, he was badly beaten, actually. I had my arm dislocated. Uh, they came for us with steel bars. We were put in the back of a van and taken out of the camp uh, to safety. I went back in the next day. Uh, I was told to cover up by the charity workers there, the, the do-gooders, the Democrats, those types, you know. They told me to cover up my shoulders because it was offensive to the Muslim men. So I stripped off. <laughs> They didn't like my tiny tits much better either. <laughs> I met a lady uh, with a little boy, and I, and I was really, I was trying to find this quieter story, you know, real women, real problems. And her, her little boy, I was, it was the first child I'd seen in camp, and she invited me into her little caravan thing. Uh, and it turned out her little boy was in fact a little girl. Except she dressed him as a boy so that at night the migrant men wouldn't come and try and steal him from her. And I learned a big lesson as well. I was naive. Migrants don't come for a new life and leave their old life behind. They bring them with them. All the old conflicts from back home. The Eritreans help, ha hate the Somalis who hate the Afghanis who don't speak to the Libyans. And they're still fighting. They come, they do not start a new life, they bring the conflicts from back home. I spent 48 hours in the cab of a large haulage truck because I wanted to understand the dangers of this crossing people were making. I always said, one day someone will die making this crossing because our truckers are at risk. British truckers' lives are at risk and indeed one has since died. And I had my eyes open once more. These entire truck stops run by the Mafia. Movement of migrants, ticketed, organized, controlled, lucrative. Officers at the port paid to turn a blind eye to the migrants crossing. It is much more systematic than we imagine. I traveled to Libya, to the coast of southern Italy, to join the migrants crossing over from the Med. You'll know that there's charity boats, Save the Children. Just because they call themselves Save the Children, it doesn't mean that they are. It is virtually a ferry service, and to be completely honest with you, for transparency, I would rather it was a ferry service. Hundreds of thousands of migrant men, fully aware of their rights, given places in local hotels to stay, given 35 euros a day, a sum that locals themselves don't earn. And when I carried on my journey and talked to these men in these hotels, they were blockading the road in the local village in southern Italy because their Wi-Fi was too slow. <laughs> the rice that they were served was too soft. And they were protesting their rights. These are the people that come. I met with a woman on the tarmac at the side of the road in the heat. 
and she looked ill. She said she was poorly. She was there to service the drivers as they passed. She was trafficked for this life. And these do-gooders, remember, think they are saving lives. They are not saving lives. They are destroying lives while they're pretending to do good. And I walked the suburbs of no-go Sweden because Trump said Sweden has fallen and the media crucified him for that. They mocked him relentlessly. I can confirm firsthand Sweden has fallen. An elderly woman grabbed me. She had only Arabic for language. She grabbed me by both arms. Wrong hair, wrong face, wrong face, wrong place. She was worried for me. She was a kind lady. I was the only white woman the only woman, the only white in the whole of the area of Sweden that I was in, where people no longer go. And she was worried for my safety. No-go Sweden has fallen to the migrants, and the Somalis still battle the Eritreans who still battle the Afghanis, just like they did in the camp at Calais. And whilst I was there, two hand grenades were found in the police station, just in a bin outside the police station. And a week later, a Muslim took a truck and rammed it into pedestrians in the shopping arcade, as you will recall. One was an 11-year-old girl. It's a curious thing, you know, how the bodies of our daughters slain by Islamist terror never make the front pages of any of the press. I interviewed a girl who lived in the forgotten suburbs because it was all she could afford. She can't go out at night. She daren't leave her home. She was burgled, but the police couldn't come because their cars are looted and torched. She said she's no longer allowed to carry pepper spray to defend herself because a girl that was attacked by a gang of Muslim men accidentally pepper sprayed the wrong guy and was prosecuted for GBH. Sat in the darkness of our home, she wouldn't even allow me to take a picture of her face for the camera before fear of reprisals by Swedish feminists who support the migrant men at all costs. In the game of Top Trumps, the victim edition, if you are a migrant, you win every time. Swedish feminists, in fact, feminists as a whole, have never been more disappointing. I fail to see how they support women. And I met the head of the toughest fire station in Sweden, who was exceptionally good looking. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> But once I moved over on that point, he was now building a bigger fence around the station to stop migrants vandalizing the engine, the fire engines, and to stop them coming in and stealing the cutting equipment, which they like to steal. I asked him whether walls like this were our future, and he looked at me really strangely. He was surprised. He said, no, it's too late for that. We no longer build walls to keep people out. Going forward, we will build walls to keep the people that we love in. And that, it still gives me the shivers now, actually. And these are my truths. These come straight from the mouths of men and women who live this stuff every day. No filter, no lens, no censorship, no Google ranking, no New York Times. And next up for me, I want to go and join the white farmers um, of South Africa who are being systematically cleansed uh, from the country by blacks there. And this way, we find our own truths. If we can resist the narrative, if we can, just by speaking to people we know, doctors, nurses, teachers, people in the street, people that have got problems, we can find our own truths. We will have the story of the people who will have the power. And then finally, the third arm of this thing is that we have to have the moral courage to fight. We have to somehow find the strength to withstand the constant attacks that we face. And Trump is the Jedi master at this game. I love him. We know what it's like to be ostracized by friends who don't like our opinions. People can be unkind. The media can be merciless. But we all need to find the moral courage to stand strong. You know, I have battles of my own, of course. I have Mrs. <laughs> who see my head as a prize. I've got the pocket-sized Muslim mayor of Londonistan, who's about as useful as a chocolate teapot. <laughs> There is a ruder version which involves a penis-flavoured lollipop, but I thought that wasn't correct for today. <laughs> I have a Muslim mayor that I cannot stand. 
He spent £1.7 million on an online hate police force to police my Twitter feed. I've been arrested for my writing. I was interviewed under caution by the Major Crime and Homicide Command uh, for a column in a newspaper. And I was referred to the Crown Prosecution Service for my commentary on life uh, because a complaint was made by the Society for Black Lawyers. I look forward to meeting the Society for White Lawyers one day. <laughs> And my family are reported to social services on a fairly regular basis. People hope that they can take my children from me, and that will silence me. The last time social services rang and said they'd had a complaint, I said, but my children at home, and my husband just made them a prawn salad, because prawns are quite posh in my family. And the guy was like, that doesn't really help. No, it doesn't. <laughs> And vexatious litigation, of course, is never far from my door. But I'm not complaining. There is no self-pity. I've put myself out there. I have to suck it up. If I don't like it, I can get home, sit on my sofa, shut up, and become a vegan. And that is not going to happen. <laughs> Resistance is key, and when we come under attack, we need to make like an arrowhead and feel the criticism falling from your sides. You know, I get a lot of emails from 16, 17-year-olds who feel like they have no voice in school anymore. They can't say if they're a Brexit supporter or if they're one of the members of Gays for Trump. They can't speak out. And I say to them, make like you're diving into a swimming pool. Feel the water coming off your sides. Feel that. Imagine that's the criticism falling off you, and keep moving forward. Forward. We can keep moving forward. The Liberals who reject Brexit or try to discredit Trump, they gave birth to our determination to succeed. They are Frankenstein and we are their monster and we are big and we are bad and we are coming for them. They are right to be afraid. We can do this. Yes, we can. <laughs> if only I was black, that would work so much better. We can commit to refuse the narrative. We can commit to arm ourselves with our truth, with no liberal filter. And we can commit to have the moral courage under attack to keep moving forward. This is our time. Do not become like Britain. Get furious and fight back. Thank you very much.
reminds me of the cornfield and the diamond. He built it, they came, coming on a break here. Be back to hear this incredible story of fortitude, determination and guts to tell his story to alive and future audiences throughout all time. Out of time we'll be right back. This work is dedicated to the guys on duty, the G.O.D. of my understanding. I am so very grateful to what some may call interdimensional beings, spirit guides and muses, those who have passed on, angels, the Holy Spirit, or whomever they may be and knowing for certain they are not of the negative polarity. These beings live in the astral and celestial spheres of the many realms, of which God consists of and has created. Knowing my conscious contact with God begins with all those of other realms whom eventually report to my Lord Jesus Christ, they having helped direct my actions through split-second divine timing. What intel do we have on this Mr. Purple tie? Intel is your department. Well, then, what is the skinny? He's been a pest to many departments and a number of our alphabet divisions. Not quite sure what he is up to. But he seems pretty sure of himself. Sources tell us. Mr. Purple Tie and his YouTube consciousness might lower the count of those enslaved within the Matrix. Well, for one thing. Your need of gorn feeding frenzies does not leave much resources for complete lockdown. Intel is my department. Whereas, confusion, panic, frustration and fear are what you do the best. So what is your plan to counter this YouTube consciousness draining our souls of control? If need be, I will direct those I direct to directly influence all resources to manage the situation concerning any and all policies pertaining to the need for resources. Meaning, I will strangle resources at a higher than logical percentage of burden to those whom are not paying attention. In other words, you intend to shut down the net. Well, about that, somehow we let it get out of our control and that would be like you biting off the first lady's nose to spite my face. I see what you are saying. You do? I, the creator of this video would like to introduce you to very incredible writings of a man named James Paget. The claim is that he was a channel for so, so many biblical and historical characters of the past. Including Jesus. You may say that the Bible tells one not to practice such things. I simply believe there are times when those in the celestial realms of the positive polarity are so intent on getting messages through to we, who are receptive and needing these guidances, that it is the Father allowing such occurrences. Considering how much evidence there is that this went on, before the government of religion took over and tampered with the Father's word, in order to keep us in the dark. I wish to let you decide for yourself as to what James Paget has ought written in the first quarter of the 20th century. I now give you, one of the many living beyond this physical realm. I'm here. Professor Salyards. Celestial Spirit. Well I am very happy and desire to write you on some phases of spirit life that I have observed in my experience of progressing. I have noticed that the spirit when it first comes into this life, is very often in a condition of darkness, not realizing where it is or what its surroundings are, and in many instances, it requires quite a long time for the spirit to realize that it is not still of earth. But in many cases this is not the condition of the spirit, for it seems to have an immediate understanding of its condition and surroundings. I attribute the first mentioned condition to be due to the fact that, when on earth, the mortal had no definite belief as to what the future life might be. And in many instances believed that the soul went into the grave with the body, to await the great resurrection day. Some of your religious denominations are preaching the doctrine now, and, the consequence will be, that all those who believe the doctrine will experience the condition of darkness and the want of knowledge of the continuity of life that I have spoken of. The second class of spirits, or those who appear to realize immediately that they have passed from earth to spirit life are those, who, while on earth, believed that the spirit when it left the body passed immediately into the heavenly spheres, or into the opposite, I mean the place of the wicked. I know that many of this class have hardly realized that they were in heaven or hell, for some little time after their entrance into spirit life. Well. As soon as the spirits realize fully that they are no longer of earth, they commence to inquire as to where they are, and many of them ask questions that indicate that they are disappointed in not realizing the expectations that they had while on earth. It is very difficult at times to convince them that there are no such places as the heavens and the hells as taught by the churches. For while our own spirit world may be a heaven or hell to them, yet the heaven or hell that they expect to find is not here, 
Some, on the other hand, do not seem to understand that they have really left the earth, because, they say, if we had left the earth life, we would know nothing, quoting Job and some of the preachers, the dead know nothing. I have been very much interested in observing these different faces of the departed spirits' beliefs and thoughts. Now all this shows the absolute necessity of mortals understanding the truths pertaining to life and death. This affords a very strong argument why spiritualism should be more extensively and earnestly taught to mortals and why the false doctrines of those who teach either that the dead know nothing, or that the departed spirit goes either to heaven or to hell in the orthodox sense, should be shown to be not only a false belief, but injurious to mankind. Let the believers and teachers of spiritualism make greater and stronger efforts to refute these harmful teachings, and they will be doing the cause of truth and of man's happiness a great good. I am not only interested in these phases but in all others, which show that the spirits, even after they realize that they are still alive, and must live as spirits continue to show the fact that their orthodox teachings are false, some say, that they may yet be able to go back into the body and await the great resurrection day for deliverance, and say that they will soon see God, and that he will take them into his heavens, where they will find that eternal rest and peace that they were taught to expect when on earth. And the wicked, even, look in dread to have some devil come and carry them to the hells where torture of the most terrible kind they think awaits them. From all this you may understand that we spirits who know the truth have a great work to do, to enable these darkened spirits to understand and believe that their false hopes and dreadful fears have no foundation in truth and will never be realized. This work many spirits are engaged in doing, and these spirits are not necessarily of the higher kind, for many spirits who occupy the earth plane and have no real spiritual enlightenment, are engaged in this work, and not now engaged in causing these dark spirits to see the truth, for I have progressed to higher things and my mission is to teach the truths of the higher life, which I have been taught by spirits who live in high spheres. This work to me is one that is not only interesting, but which gives me the great happiness that comes with the realization that I have been the means of leading a spirit to learn to love God, and to receive the happiness which the love of God gives to spirits. I tell you that this teaching is the grandest that I ever engaged in in all my life. When on earth, as I taught and saw the young mind develop, I found much happiness in the knowledge that I was doing some good, but here, in my teachings, when I see a soul develop, I realize that I am doing a spirit that greatest of all good in bringing it at one in love with the Father. And happiness here and that of earth, is as the soul development is so much greater than the development of the mere mind, my work is not confined entirely to this teaching. I also am engaged in trying to assist mortals to a true conception of the life here. I mean the spiritual part of this life. No man is entirely without spirit influence, whether good or evil. Many are susceptible to the influence of the evil spirits, and for that reason the work of the good spirits is so much more difficult. There is in man's nature that which leads him to evil thoughts so much easier than to good thoughts. This is an old saying, I know, but is a true one, and the fact that it has been said so often and for so long a time, does not decrease the importance of it as a truth. So while men have felt this evil inclination in their nature, the fight between the good and evil influences will be somewhat unequal. The advantage though with the good influences is that what they suggest is truth which will never die, while the suggestions of the evil influences last only for a comparatively short time. When the material gives up the spirit being which it clothes, that being will then be relieved of many of these natural tendencies to evil thoughts and deeds. And while this mere separation does not make a devil a saint, it makes it so much easier for the spirit to get rid of many of these evil tendencies, and makes him more susceptible to the influence of truth and goodness. You must not think from this, as soon as they have been in the spirit world for a little time, they become good spirits, for that is not true. Many evil spirits have been in the spirit world for a great many years, and yet have their evil thoughts and desires, and all the evil qualities of hatred, malice, envy, etc. As when they were on earth. Their giving up the earth life did not deprive them of their will, the greatest force or power that God gave to man, except that of love. And many of these spirits are refused to exercise their will in a way that will enable them to rid themselves of these evil thoughts and desires. So you see, the mere fact of a becoming a spirit does not mean that the mortal has become a good and saintly spirit. No, I am sorry to say that many men who are very evil on earth are still evil as spirits. And their happiness, which they think they have, is only that happiness, which they, as men, thought they realized from the exercise of evil thoughts and acts. Yet there is one great redeeming fact connected with their dark and sad condition, and that is, that in the end, whenever it so pleases God, all evil will be banished from the spirit world, and all spirits will be given that happiness which comes from a nature free from sin and error. Not by the fiat of God, but by men seeking and doing those things that will free the soul from sin and error and again come into harmony with God's laws. 
just such I imagine as Adam and Eve enjoyed in the historical Garden of Eden, but that happiness, while of a character that brings much contentment and peace, yet is not the true happiness which God is waiting to give all his children who ask and seek for the inflowing of the divine love in their souls. I will not discourse on this great happiness tonight, as it would take too long and you are somewhat tired. But will say that all men should seek for it both on earth and in the spirit world. When on earth I did not have it, but since I came here I found it, and now possess it, thanks be to God and his loving kindness. You folks all have it, and many others too numerous to mention. Let me stop now as I am tired and you need to rest. So with all my love and best wishes, I am your old professor, Joseph H. Salyards. I, the flesh and blood living person would like to invite you to simply look at the table of contents of Mr. Paget's writings and to continue to watch and listen to my extra normal videos. No one man or council of living men could have dreamt up the wisdom of these writings. Let, let me explain the problem science has with Jesus Christ. You're a Christian, aren't you? Yes sir. You know I am, dude. So you believe in God? Absolutely. Is God good? Sure. God is good. Is God all powerful? Can God do anything? Yes. Are you good or evil? The Bible says I'm evil. Ah? The Bible. Here's one for you. Let's say there's a sick person over here and you can cure him. You can do it. Would you help them? Would you try? You know, I would. So, you're good. I wouldn't say that. Why not say that? You would help a sick and maimed person if you could. In fact most of us would if we could. God doesn't. He doesn't, does he? My brother was a Christian who died of cancer even though he prayed to Jesus to heal him. How is this Jesus good? Whom? Can you answer that one? No, you can't, can you? Let's start again, dude. Is God good? Er, uh, yes. Is Satan good? No. Where does Satan come from? From God. That's right. God made Satan, didn't he? Tell me, dude. Is there evil in this world? Yup. Evil is everywhere, isn't it? Did God make everything? Yup. Who created evil? Is there sickness in this world? Immorality. Hatred. Ugliness. All the terrible things. Do they exist in this world? Yup. Who created them? Don't you see it all over the place? Don't you? Is God good? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, dude? You know I do. Science says you have five senses you use to identify and observe the world around you. Have you ever seen Jesus? Nope. I've never seen him. Have you ever felt your Jesus? Tasted your Jesus? Or smelt your Jesus? In fact, do you have any sensory perception of your God whatsoever? Yet, you still believe in him? Yup, that takes faith. According to the rules of empirical, testable, demonstrable protocol, science says your God doesn't exist. What do you say to that, dude? Where is your God now? Is it, my turn now, Mr. Smarty Pants? Ah, yet another Christian argument, for the vanguard of Jesus. Come, come, now, speak some proper, bowling, alley, parking lot wisdom. Some interesting points you are making, sir. Now I've got a question for you. Is there such thing as heat? Yes, there is heat. Is there such a thing as cold? Sure dude, there is cold too. No, sir, there isn't. You can have lots of heat, even more heat, super heat, mega heat, white heat, a little heat or no heat, but we don't have anything called cold. We can hit 273 degrees below zero, which is no heat but we can't go any further after that. There is no such thing as cold, otherwise we would be able to go colder than minus 273 degrees Celsius. You see, sir, cold is only a word we use to describe the absence of heat. We cannot measure cold. Heat we can measure in thermal units because heat is energy. 
Cold is not the opposite of heat, sir, just the absence of it. Is there such a thing as darkness? Dude? That's a dumb question, dude. What is night if it isn't darkness? What are you getting at? So you say there is such a thing as darkness? Yes, I. You're wrong again, Mr. Smarty Pants. Darkness is not something, it is the absence of something. You can have low light, normal light, bright light, flashing light. But if you have no light constantly you have nothing and it's called darkness, isn't it? That's the meaning we use to define the word. In reality, darkness isn't. If it were, you would be able to make darkness darker and give me a jar of it. Can you give me a jar of darker darkness? What is your point, dude? My point is, your philosophical premise is flawed to start with and so your conclusion must be an error. Flawed? How dare you? You are working on the premise of duality. That for example there is life and then there's death? A good God and a bad God. You are viewing the concept of God as something finite, something we can measure. Sir, science cannot even explain a thought. It uses electricity and magnetism but has never been seen, much less fully understood them. To view death as the opposite of life is to be ignorant of the fact that death cannot exist as a substantive thing. Death is not the opposite of life, merely the absence of it. Is there such a thing as immorality? Of course there is. Wrong again, sir. You see, immorality is merely the absence of morality. Is there such thing as injustice? No. Injustice is the absence of justice. Is there such a thing as evil? Isn't evil the absence of good? If there is evil in the world, professor, and we all agree there is, then God, if he exists, must be accomplishing a work through the agency of evil. What is that work God is accomplishing? The Bible tells us it is to see if each one of us will, of our own free will, choose good over evil. As a philosophical scientist, I don't view this matter as having anything to do with any choice. As a realist, I absolutely do not recognize the concept of God or any other theological factor as being part of the world equation because God is not observable. I would have thought that the absence of God's moral code in this world is probably one of the most observable phenomena going, newspapers make billions of dollars reporting it every week. Tell me, Pastor, do you teach your flock, that they evolved from a monkey? If you are referring to the natural evolutionary process, dude, yes, of course I do. Have you ever observed evolution with your own eyes, sir? Since no one has ever observed the process of evolution at work and cannot even prove that this process is an ongoing endeavor, are you not teaching your opinion, sir? Are you now not a scientist, but a preacher? I overlook your impudence in the light of our philosophical discussion. Now, have you quite finished? So you don't accept God's moral code to do what is righteous? I believe in what is. That's science. Ah! Science. Sir, you rightly state that science is the study of observed phenomena. Science too, is a premise which is flawed. Science is flawed. Is there anyone in town, who has ever seen you mind? Is there anyone here who has ever heard your mind? Felt your mind, touched or smelt that thing? No one appears to have done so. It appears no one here has had any sensory perception of that thing. Whatsoever. Well, according to the rules of empirical, stable, demonstrable protocol, science, I declare you, has no mind. How could I bowl a 301, if I didn't have a mind? You cannot bowl, a 301. Well tell me dude. How could I bowl a 300, and lose? What is the greatest obstacle to experiencing this reality? Identification with your mind, which causes thought to become compulsive. 
Not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction, but we don't realize this because almost everybody is suffering from it, so it is considered normal. This incessant mental noise prevents you from finding that realm of inner stillness that is inseparable from being. It also creates a false mind-made self that casts a shadow of fear and suffering. The philosopher Descartes believed that he had found the most fundamental truth when he made his famous statement, I think, therefore I am. He had, in fact, given expression to the most basic error, to equate thinking with being and identity with thinking. The compulsive thinker, which means almost everyone, lives in a state of apparent separateness, in an instantly complex world of continuous problems and conflict, a world that reflects the ever-increasing fragmentation of the mind. Enlightenment is a state of awareness, of being, at one, and therefore at peace. At one with life in its manifested aspect, the world, as well as with your deepest self and life and manifested at one with being. Enlightenment is not only the end of suffering and of continuous conflict within and without, but also the end of the dreadful enslavement to incessant thinking. What an incredible liberation this is! Identification with your mind creates an opaque screen of concepts, labels, images, words, judgments, and definitions that blocks all true relationship. It comes between you and yourself, between you and your fellow man and woman, between you and nature, between you and God. It is this screen of thought that creates the illusion of separateness, the illusion that there is you and the totally separate, other. You then forget the essential fact that, underneath the level of physical appearances and separate forms, you are one with all that is. By, forget, I mean that you can no longer feel this oneness as self-evident reality. You may believe it to be true, but you no longer know it to be true. A belief may be comforting. Only through your own experience, however, does it become liberating. Thinking has become a disease. Disease happens when things get out of balance. For example, there is nothing wrong with cells dividing and multiplying in the body, but when this process continues in disregard of the total organism, cells proliferate and we have disease. Note, the mind is a superb instrument if used rightly. Used wrongly. However, it becomes very destructive. To put it more accurately, it is not so much that you use your mind wrongly you usually don't use it at all. It uses you. This is the disease. You believe that you are your mind. This is the delusion. The instrument has taken you over. I don't quite agree. It is true that I do a lot of aimless thinking, like most people, but I can still choose to use my mind to get and accomplish things, and I do that all the time. Just because you can solve a crossword puzzle or build an atom bomb doesn't mean that you use your mind. Just as dogs love to chew bones, the mind loves to get its teeth into problems. That's why it does crossword puzzles and builds atom bombs. You have no interest in either. Let me ask you this. Can you be free of your mind whenever you want to? Have you found the off button? You mean stop thinking altogether? No, I can't, except maybe for a moment or two. Then the mind is using you. You are unconsciously identified with it, so you don't even know that you are its slave. It's almost as if you were possessed without knowing it, and so you take the possessing entity to be yourself. The beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the possessing entity, the thinker. Knowing this enables you to observe the entity. The moment you start watching the thinker a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought, that thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all the things that truly matter beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace arise from beyond the mind. You begin to awaken. What exactly do you mean by watching the thinker? When someone goes to the doctor and says, I hear a voice in my head, he or she will most likely be sent to a psychiatrist. The fact is that, in a very similar way, virtually everyone hears a voice, or several voices, in their head all the time, the involuntary thought processes that you don't realize you have the power to stop. 
continuous monologues or dialogues. You have probably come across mad people in the street incessantly talking or muttering to themselves. Well, that's not much different from what you and all other normal people do, except that you don't do it out loud. The voice comments, speculates, judges, compares, complains, likes, dislikes, and so on. The voice isn't necessarily relevant to the situation you find yourself in at the time, it may be reviving the recent or distant past or rehearsing or imagining possible future situations. Here it often imagines things going wrong and negative outcomes, this is called worry. Sometimes this soundtrack is accompanied by visual images or mental movies. Even if the voice is relevant to the situation at hand, it will interpret it in terms of the past. This is because the voice belongs to your conditioned mind, which is the result of all your past history as well as of the collective cultural mindset you inherited. So you see and judge the present through the eyes of the past and get a totally distorted view of it. It is not uncommon for the voice to be a person's own worst enemy. Many people live with a tormentor in their head that continuously attacks and punishes them and drains them of vital energy. It is the cause of untold misery and unhappiness, as well as of disease. The good news is that you can free yourself from your mind. This is the only true liberation. You can take the first step right now. Start listening to the voice in your head as often as you can. Pay particular attention to any repetitive thought patterns those old gramophone records that have been playing in your head perhaps for many years. This is what I mean by watching the thinker, which is another way of saying listen to the voice in your head, be there as the witnessing presence. When you listen to that voice listen to it impartially. That is to say do not judge, do not judge or condemn what you hear, for doing so would mean that the same voice has come in again through the back door. You will soon realize, there is the voice, and here I am listening to it, watching it. This I am realization. This sense of your own presence is not a thought. It arises from beyond the mind. So when you listen to a thought, you are aware not only of the thought but also of yourself as the witness of the thought. A new dimension of consciousness has come in. As you listen to the thought, you feel a conscious presence, your deeper self behind or underneath the thought, as it were. The thought then loses its power over you and quickly subsides because you are no longer energizing the mind through identification with it. This is the beginning of the end of involuntary and compulsive thinking. When a thought subsides, you experience a discontinuity in the mental stream, a gap of no mind. At first, the gaps will be short, a few seconds perhaps, but gradually they will become longer. When these gaps occur, you feel a certain stillness and peace inside you. This is the beginning of your natural state of felt oneness with being, which is usually obscured by the mind. With practice, the sense of stillness and peace will deepen. In fact, there is no end to its depth. You will also feel a subtle emanation of joy rising from deep within, the joy of being. It is not a trance-like state. Not at all. There is no loss of consciousness here. The opposite is the case. If the price of peace were a lowering of your consciousness, and the price of stillness a lack of vitality and alertness, then they would not be worth having. In this state of inner connectedness, you are much more alert, more awake than in the mind-identified state. You are fully present. It also raises the vibrational frequency of the energy field that gives life to the physical body. As you go more deeply into this realm of no mind, as it is sometimes called in the East, you realize the state of pure consciousness. In that state, you feel your own presence with such intensity and such joy that all thinking, all emotions, your physical body as well as the whole external world become relatively insignificant in comparison to it. And yet this is not a selfish but a selfless state. It takes you beyond what you previously thought of as yourself. That presence is essentially you and at the same time inconceivably greater than you. What I am trying to convey here may sound paradoxical or even contradictory, but there is no other way that I can express it. 
Instead of watching the thinker, you can also create a gap in the mind stream simply by directing the focus of your attention into the now. Just become intensely conscious of the present moment. This is a deeply satisfying thing to do. In this way, you draw consciousness away from mind activity and create a gap of no mind in which you are highly alert and aware, but not thinking. This is the essence of meditation. In your everyday life, you can practice this by taking any routine activity that normally is only a means to an end and giving it your fullest attention, so that it becomes an end in itself. For example, every time you walk up and down the stairs in your house or place of work, pay close attention to every step, every movement, even your breathing. Be totally present. Or when you wash your hands, pay attention to all the sense perceptions associated with the activity, the sound and feel of the water, the movement of your hands, the scent of the soap, and so on. Or when you get into your car, after you close the door, pause for a few seconds and observe the flow of your breath. Become aware of a silent but powerful sense of presence. There is one certain criterion by which you can measure your success in this practice, the degree of peace that you feel within. So the single most vital step on your journey toward enlightenment is this, learn to disidentify from your mind. Every time you create a gap in the stream of mind, the light of your consciousness grows stronger. One day you may catch yourself smiling at the voice in your head, as you would smile at the antics of a child. This means that you no longer take the content of your mind all that seriously, as your sense of self does not depend on it. Isn't thinking essential? Your mind is an instrument, a tool. It is there to be used for a specific task, and when the task is completed, you lay it down. As it is, I would say about 80 to 90 percent of most people's thinking is not only repetitive and useless, but because of its dysfunctional and often negative nature, much of it is also harmful. Observe your mind and you will find this to be true. It causes a serious leakage of vital energy kind of compulsive thinking is actually an addiction. What characterizes an addiction? Quite simply this, you no longer feel that you have the choice to stop. It seems stronger than you. It also gives you a false sense of pleasure, pleasure that invariably turns into pain. Why should we be addicted to thinking? Because you are identified with it, which means that you derive your sense of self from the content and activity of your mind. Because you believe that you would cease to be if you stopped thinking. As you grow up, you form a mental image of who you are, based on your personal and cultural conditioning. We may call this phantom self the ego. It consists of mind activity and can only be kept going through constant thinking. The term ego means different things to different people, but when I use it here it means a false self, created by unconscious identification with the mind. To the ego, the present moment hardly exists. Only past and future are considered important. This total reversal of the truth accounts for the fact that in the ego mode the mind is so dysfunctional. It is always concerned with keeping the past alive, because without it, who are you? It constantly projects itself into the future to ensure its continued survival and to seek some kind of release or fulfillment there. It says, one day, when this that or the other happens, I am going to be okay happy at peace. Even when the ego seems to be concerned with the present, it is not the present that it sees, it misperceives it completely because it looks at it through the eyes of the past. Or it reduces the present to a means to an end, an end that always lies in the mind projected future. Observe your mind and you'll see that this is how it works. Roll the dice. Hi, Google. Yeah. This is the true ray. If you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. And you too, YouTube. You're not getting to me at all. If you're going to try, go all the way. It is not bothering me that I cannot reply to comments. Go all the way. It's not bothering me. It is not affecting me in the least. And I'm not 
quitting. Do you understand me? This could mean losing girlfriends, jobs, and maybe your mind. I'm not backing out of YouTube. I'm not leaving my subscribers alone with you people. It could mean not eating for three or four days. It could mean freezing on a park bench. It could mean jail. It could mean derision, mockery, isolation. I am not. Do you hear me? I am... I'm not going to break my computer. I'm not leaving YouTube. Isolation is the gift. All the others are a test of your endurance, of how much you really want to do it. And you'll do it, despite rejection and the worst odds. And it will be better than anything else you can imagine. You can't make me. I have a lot to say, and I'm going to keep on saying it, and you cannot stop me. If you're going to try, go all the way. There is no other feeling like that. And I'm not at all frustrated. Not at all. Not at all. My commenters are waiting to hear from me. And they will. I will figure out the trick. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. All the way. All the way. You will ride life straight to perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is. You cannot stop us. You cannot stop the truth. You cannot stop me. I am the true Ray, and I will speak the truth in spite of you. And I'm fine. 